Elements have been around since ancient times, and it's impossible to know who originally discovered them. The Torah, for example, contains passages dating back 3,000 years ago that refer to gold, silver, iron, copper, lead, and tin. But chemistry really began when we mastered our first reaction, setting fire to stuff. The ability to create and control fire helped us to hunt, cook, ward off predators, stay warm in winter, and manufacture primitive tools. Originally, we burnt things like wood and fat, but it turns out that most things are combustible. Now, things catch on fire because they come into contact with oxygen, one of the most reactive elements out there. The only reason things aren't bursting into flame all the time is that while oxygen is reactive, it needs energy to get going. That's why starting a fire also requires something like warmth or friction. Oxygen has to be heated in order to combust. The most flammable chemical ever made though, far worse than oxygen, was created in 1930 by two scientists named Otto Ruff and Herbert Krug. Meet chlorine trifluoride. Made from the elements chlorine and fluorine, in a 1 to 3 ratio, chlorine trifluoride is unique in being able to ignite literally anything it touches, including fire extinguishers. A green liquid at room temperature and a colorless gas when it's warmed, chlorine trifluoride will set fire to glass and sand, asbestos, and Kevlar, the material from which firefighter suits are made. It will even set fire to water itself, spitting out fumes of hydrofluoric acid in the process. During the 1940s, a few cautious attempts were made to use it as rocket fuel, but it inevitably kept setting fire to the rockets themselves, so the projects were abandoned. The only people who made a serious attempt to harness its power were the Nazi weapon researchers at Falkenhagen Bunker. The idea was to use it as flamethrower fuel, but it then set fire to the flamethrower and anyone carrying it, so again, it was deemed unusable. Just think about that for a second. Not only will it set fire to water, chlorine trifluoride is so evil, even the Nazis didn't want to mess with it. So, so what makes it so potent? The answer is that fluorine behaves in a very similar way to oxygen, but needs less energy to get started. It's the most reactive element on the periodic table and effectively out oxygen's oxygen at breaking other chemicals down. So, when you combine it with chlorine, the second most reactive element, you get an unholy alliance that starts fires without encouragement. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus was so enamored with fire that he declared it to be the purest substance, the basic matter from which reality was made. According to him, everything was somehow made from fire in one form or another. Fire was, in other words, elemental. It was an understandable assumption to make since fire does appear to have magic qualities. But the reason why it was so difficult to identify elements in the ancient world was because, unknown to early philosophers, very few elements occur in their pure state. Most of them are unstable and combine to form element fusions, which we call compounds. Almost everything we come across in nature is a compound, so while something like table salt may look pure, the game is rigged. Table salt is actually a compound of sodium and chloride, the true elements. It wasn't until the late 17th century that a German experimenter named Henning Brandt proved everyday substances had elements locked inside them and that most stuff that we thought were pure weren't at all. One of Brandt's hobbies was boiling vast quantities of urine in his lab, probably because it was gold-colored and he was hoping to make a fortune by solidifying it into the precious metal. One night in 1669, 
After many hours of what must have been unpleasant work, Brandt was left with a thick red syrup and black residue similar to what you get after burning toast. He mixed these two things together and heated the mixture once more, and what happened next made no sense. The mixture of urine syrup and cooking schmutz suddenly formed a waxy solid which was extremely flammable and gave off blinding white light as it burned. He somehow extracted fire from water. Brant named his chemical phosphorus from the Greek word light bringer and spent the next six years experimenting with it in secret. Eventually, he was running out of money, so Brant went public with the discovery. Today, we understand exactly what was going on in Brant's method. The human body's recommended intake of phosphorus is somewhere between 0.5 and 0.8 grams a day. But since everything we eat contains phosphorus, we tend to consume over twice that amount. All this excess is passed into the urine, and Brant was boiling away everything else. His discovery marked a crucial moment for chemistry because the extracted phosphorus was so different from its source. Urine doesn't glow in the dark, but it obviously contains a chemical that does. It was proof that there were chemicals hiding in plain sight. The elements were no longer out of reach. At the beginning of the 18th century, the German chemist, George Stahl, armed with the new knowledge that everyday substances could be made from hidden elements, decided to put forward an explanation for fire. When metals burnt, they formed a colored powder, which were called calcs at the time. Calxes were notoriously difficult to set on fire, so Stahl concluded that they were elements difficult to ignite because their fire had been removed. According to this hypothesis, anything flammable contained a substance that escaped into the air when it was heated, leaving behind the charred remains. The substance was named phlogiston from the Greek to set on fire, and Stahl argued that a fire was phlogiston being separated from the calx. Stahl's fire hypothesis was important because, unlike previous ideas about chemistry, it was testable. If correct, it should be possible to trap phlogiston and combine it with a calx to regenerate the original metal. By putting forward an idea that could be proven wrong, Stahl gave us a genuine scientific hypothesis. And, like most scientific hypotheses, it was quickly destroyed. The first chink in the armor came from a British scientist, Henry Cavendish. He was a notoriously shy man, but made great contributions to chemistry through a series of experiments involving acid and iron. The reaction between these two always released an invisible gas, which Cavendish collected. His first thought was that he was successfully getting a hold of phlogiston, until he discovered something odd. The gas was explosive. If fire was the result of phlogiston escaping, how could phlogiston itself be burned? How could phlogiston escape from itself? Stranger still, when Cavendish's gas, which he called flammable air, exploded, it generated pure water. And if you could make water from other things, well, maybe water wasn't elemental either. The next mystery came in 1774 from the heretical English clergyman Joseph Priestley. Priestley was experimenting on calx of mercury, the red powdery substance you get when mercury is burned, and he did that by directing beams of sunlight through a magnifying glass onto the mercury. He collected the gas that was given off and found that other things burned very well inside it, better than it did in normal air. Whatever this gas was, it was clearly very good at removing phlogiston. 
So logically, this gas had to have very little phlogiston in order to absorb it, so he called it deflogisticated air. Priestley decided to seal some mice in a box with his deflogisticated gas, and they survived without harm. He also discovered that after testing it on himself, that it was actually preferable to breathing than regular air and made him feel quite euphoric. Priestley also discovered that plants seemed to breathe this gas out, replenishing a room after a fire had burned. The whole thing was very, very confusing. Fires generating water, metals generating fire, and plants generating air. What in the world was going on? The answer to all these riddles came in 1775, when Priestley shared his phlogiston results with the French chemist Antoine Lavoisier. Lavoisier worked for the French government collecting taxes, but his real passion was science. He had already been experimenting on calxes by the time Priestley's experiments came to his attention, and he decided that it was time to put the phlogiston hypothesis to the test. If fire was the result of phlogiston leaving a substance, then the leftover calx should weigh less. Now, precision equipment didn't really exist in the 18th century. Imagine trying to distinguish a powder weighing 1 gram from a powder weighing 1.1 gram. Quite the challenge. Lavoisier decided to scale up Priestley's experiments to get a clear difference between the results. The difference between 1,000 kilograms and 1,100 kilograms is a difference which you can observe with the naked eye. So Lavoisier constructed a 9-foot magnifying glass and blasted a plate full of mercury calx with sunlight. The results were unmistakable. The calx weighed more than the original metal. Everyone had had it wrong. Fire wasn't the removal of phlogiston. It was something being added from the air itself. Substances like metals and phosphorus were the elements, and fire was what happened when they combined with Priestley's gas. As brilliant as this insight was, Lavoisier was imperfect, and he mistakenly thought that Priestley's gas was also responsible for the sour taste of acids. So he named the gas from the Greek word Oxys genus, or acid maker, which translates into English as oxygen. The exploding gas that Henry Cavendish isolated was a different element, and when heated with oxygen, it combined to form water. Lavoisier named this gas from the Greek hydrogenus, or water maker, and it translates into hydrogen. This new way of looking at things also explained why you couldn't breathe in a room after a fire had been burning. It wasn't because the fire was giving out a toxic substance, phlogiston, but rather it was because the air was partly made of oxygen and fire absorbed it, leaving the other gas behind. This other gas was eventually shown to react under extreme conditions and it was used to make nitre, one of the key ingredients in gunpowder. So it was named nitrogenous or nitrogen. So, to recap, science always progresses when a hypothesis is proven wrong, and Lavoisier's experiments signed the death warrant on phlogiston. Air was an unreacted mixture of nitrogen and oxygen, water was a compound of hydrogen and oxygen, and fire was a reaction between oxygen and any available chemical. So there you have it, the story of how we began to uncover elements and understand what fire was and disprove the phlogiston theory. If you learned something you didn't know, be sure to let me know what that was by leaving a comment down below and which topic you'd like to see covered next.